2000, student leaders gave short speeches and proceeded to Pesh City Hall. And at this point, moderates, moderate politicians waiting in the wings uh, joined them and soon took over. So the students had played their role. Number two, uh, well, okay, before I get to number two, the rest, uh, well, for, for those, of, those of you who are familiar with the 19th century history, uh, is history. Days later, Hungary had a liberal constitution and a representative government. A year later, it became a republic independent of Austria. Another year and a half later, Petrofi was dead, killed in battle by a soldier of the invading Russian Imperial Army. The revolution and war of independence failed, the Habsburgs and authoritarian rule were re-established. The larger context in this case was, of course, the, the so-called Spring of Nations a wave of liberal revolution sweeping across Europe. And yes, this is where the Arab Spring gets its name. As for the larger political agenda, Hungary's political um, class, the landed gentry, soon took over, and eventually, after the defeat of 48, regrouped, and in 1867 took government, fulfilling most of the demands of the 48ers, minus the more radical and democratic ones. So number two of the examples. Fast forward to um, more than a century to 1956. Uh, we are in the last dying days of the Stalinist regimes in Eastern and East Central Europe. And Hungarian students, along with most of the rest of the population, are again um, that they are fed up with eight years of Stalinist dictatorships, dictatorship and impatient with the glacial pace of reforms after Stalin's death in 1953. Um, they clamor for a, a more dem democratic society, etc., etc. Um, so. Um, they are again students in, uh, in the vanguard of, of reform movement. Uh, the Budapest faculties of economics and engineering have um, quite a change today, are in turmoil. Students organize independent unions and are penning a manifesto, and you guessed it, it's called not 12 but 15 points. It calls for withdrawal of Soviet troops, free press free assembly, free media, which at the time consists of one medium radio. Uh, also, lists multi-party elections, solidarity with the worker strikes going on at the same time in Poland, and, and so on and so forth. They plan a rally. It's immediately banned by the authorities, then reauthorized, then banned again. So there's a lot of confusion going on in the wide you know, <laughs> context. Uh, but by then, tens of thousands of students marched to two statues in Budapest. One is of General Benz, who was the Polish freedom fighter who came to fight for Hungarian freedom in 18, back in 1848. And the other statue is that of Sean Petrofis, you know, and that's where they read, a famous actor reads uh, the same poem that from uh, 100 years ago. So the, again, the rest is history. By the end of the day, the peaceful student demonstration is turned into a uh, <laughs> peaceful demonstration. It's not much about peacefulness. Uh, armed uprising in which students and workers clash with security police uh, because the regular police changes sides and joins the demonstrators. And in and. Uh, 11 days of the Hungarian 1956 uprising follows. In this case, the wider context is the dismantling of Stalinism and its replacement by an eventually less repressive so-called state socialist regime. As for the students, they were the face, again, the public face, sort of the front line of the small group of reform communists organizing in the wings, again and whose reformist goals, in turn, were swept up in a powerful and much broader popular, popular uprising. And just like in 1848, the revolution was brutally repressed and law and order re-established. 
Now, if you got the impression that literary symbols are at the heart of understanding East Central European history, you, you would be right. Our next stop is 1968 Warsaw. The spark here is provided by a play of the Polish romantic poet, Adam Mickiewicz. His classic, The Forefathers' Eve, originally written in the 1830s about the martyrdom of Polish, Poland under Russian occupation, has been playing to packed audiences since the fall of 1967. To them, to the audience, that is, the allusions to censorship and the police state have a wholly contemporary and fresh resonance. So if you ask why the, the, the Polish authorities uh, allowed the play to be mounted, you would have a very good point. Well, Mickiewicz was problematic, because Mickiewicz was, after all, the Polish national literary icon. And in the climate of the reformist 1960s, it's a fine line to walk for the communist leadership. So they, um, they are sort of maneuvering. In January 1968, following performances with the, uh, with the audience loudly cheering uh, uh, anti-Russian lines in the play, the, uh, it's finally banned. And after the last performance, an overcapacity crowd, many of them students, proceed to the statue of the poet in the center of the city with banners demanding the end of censorship. The police, mostly security police units, attack, and things ex escalate from there. Warsaw University students rally, protesting the police brutality and censorship, and demanding the release of arrested students. But instead, more arrests come, and demonstrations spread to universities all over Poland, with hundreds of students arrested and expelled. Many from the faculty who express solidarity with the students are also expelled, like the philosophy professor Leszek Polakowski. Eventually, Oxford will be very happy to have him. So what is the broader context here? 1968 in the West. At this point, January 1968, it's only in Berlin and Italy, not yet Paris. The anti-Vietnam campus rallies in the US, and of course, the ongoing Prague Spring. This, along with many factors, is uh, too complicated to go into here, uh, explains the swift reaction of the Polish authorities. Um, and uh, James Croft is here who can answer all your questions about how the, all these events all happened in 1968 in East Central Europe and Western Europe interrelate or not. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop here and just um, could I have another two? Okay. So, um, so I have a, a bonus course example, and this is back um, not so so far in time, 1980s this time, Budapest, uh, and this is the only example that, that concerns uh, much closer a university setting. Um, so this is early 1980s, an era of cynicism. There's not much romanticism left. Um, pretty much all illusions about reforming existing socialism gone. What is left is what it used to call it shades of gray. And um, what else is happening? Solidarity is on the rise in Poland. Czechoslovakia is buried under deep snow. And Budapest University, and this is where I happen to go to at the time, is a, is a quite peculiar place to study history in the 1980s. The only similarity with McGill would be the location. It is in the heart of a bustling um, city. Uh, but then, more, by more than a century of conservatism and the lack of political freedoms took its toll at the university and, and in the makeup of the faculty. Humanities professors, and especially historians, are ranked not so much by professional standards and merit, but by their uh, reliability terms of ideology and politics. So, um, so this is a funny place to go to study history, right? Uh, as far as police goes, there is not much evidence of that on campus, and there is very little need for policing indeed. Repression is internalized. 
minor regressions are tolerated, but serious violence uh, is kept in check by constant surveillance that is, again, assumed and probably happening and uh, by, very, by very subtle means. Um, so there is an emerging opposition, a very small democratic opposition, in, uh, around 200 all in all, uh, and this is, the, uh, this is the time when the idea to establish a so-called free university comes up. The name uh, is free university means it's a pun, both on, it, it really means uh, open university. It's as popular, of course, is in the tradition in England and, and Belgium and elsewhere. Uh, it turns out that the security forces call it the flying university because they assume very correctly that the form came from came out of the Polish tradition uh, where they really had to uh, change locations all the time because of very very serious police repression. So what, what does it mean? Every Monday during the regular school semester, people meet in private apartments about a you know numbers are between 50 and 100, uh, to do what? To listen to university lectures. So they sit or stand in, in you know, quiet, and it's a very, you know, they take notes, they, they do everything that university students usually do. Uh, but the lectures, the content of them, is, is quite different from what they would listen to at their normal, regular university. It concerns mostly recent history, and more, more, most importantly, the real history of 1956, officially still called a counter-revolution. And so it's about learning about your own history that is banned and suppressed, but also to reclaim your history, right? Now, you would again have to ask, why was it allowed to proceed? Um, what do you think? Well, again, as in the 1960s, it's a very fine line for the authorities. It is considered more useful to keep this going. This goes on for a few years in, in the early 1980s, and by the mid to late 1980s, um, it, it's sort of dying out because um, other means of opposition are taking over. Um, it is, it is um, progressively easier to get your information about recent political events from some is that literature and books smuggled in from the West, etc., etc. Uh, 1989, uh, there's, a, there's a, an enormous uh, demonstration on, in, in June in, um, in, in, in a public square. Uh, allowed by the authorities, and this, and this is um, the symbolic reburial of Imre Nagy, uh, the prime minister who was executed uh, after 1956. The most memorable speech at the time is given by a young man. He's a student leader, a recent graduate of law school, and he's the only one who's not wearing a suit, but just a beautiful white shirt. And um, so he's a member of a, of a student group um, who are coming out from a, a, of a university college formed in the 1980s, and eventually they form a political party that promises a new, useful kind of alternative politics. Um, so I, let me just, I'm sorry, to conclude with, with two points, and then for the rest I, I let you draw your own conclusions. So the name of this young law graduate uh, is Orban, uh, Viktor Orban. Today he is uh, Hungary's prime minister, and that sounds like a happy story, right? Except he's the most conservative, most authoritarian prime minister heading the most conservative authoritarian government that Hungary had seen since the fall of communism. <laughs> he and his party introduced laws establishing censorship, curtailed the mandate of judges and the constitutional court, uh, rewriting the liberal constitution, and just two days ago introduced a law that makes homelessness a crime. Um, so um, I'm, 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 I'm letting go my other conclusion and, and uh, just uh, a, a sort of a, I like to be a <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, yeah. I
Netherlands in Europe since uh, 2007, and we'll be talking about France and uh, Greece. So, um, from very early times, human societies have identified spaces uh, which are either safe for people, or they have identified procedures allowing people to feel protected. And the question we have to ask is why? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is they wanted to avoid an escalation of a dispute to the stage of blind, unstoppable, reciprocal violence. And how do they do that? Well, by breaking the circle of violence through allowing people to escape unjust and even sometimes just retaliation. As an extension of this effort, uh, there has appeared the idea of allowing for dissenting or minority views, if you want, to exist without fear of brutal subjugation. Therefore, sanctuaries, temples, etc., functioned in different societies at different times as asylum, guaranteeing safety to the people putting themselves under the protection of the gods. Now, what happened if asylum was violated? Because it, it, it was like, a, like uh, it, this happened. Well, let's have a case. We probably have, maybe have heard of the name of Simon. Simon, what's it Well, no. Not this one. Well, not this Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Cylon. The Cylon goes back to like Acropolis, you know, so it goes back to Athens. Cylon is um, an Athenian who, uh, 7th century BC, uh, won the Olympic Games and after winning the Olympic Games became very popular, so he staged a coup d'etat and occupied with his supporters Acropolis, which had like a reconstruction there, like that one, but um, he failed following the efficient reaction of the city's governors, of uh, officials. Now, Simon's supporters uh, implored the protection of the goddess Athena, which is the word in the province, it was a temple there, in order to be protected. So they asked for asylum. Uh, now, the negotiation takes place, and they are promised they can leave safely the grounds. And so the asylum seekers thus attach themselves with the court altogether. They attach that court to the sanctuary, which is this way they are always linked to the sanctuary, thus to the protection, and they start leaving the Acropolis, which is a help. Now, all by chance, the court will break, or is rather cut, we can probably presume, and the city's officials then, and henchmen, uh, arguing that this was a divine sign indicating that they were not protected by the goddess, massacred them. And there, there is, the story takes an interesting twist. Because till then, the city had, of course, I mean, they had faced the coup d'etat, and which had, you know, uh, they weren't happy about. It. But now, there is widespread indignation. It is seen as a major outrage to the goddess and to the official who actually organized this. And who had just saved this, as a matter of fact. He's cursed and thus banned from the city with his supporters. And uh, so he's like sent away. Now, as antiquity was coming to an end and Christianity was taking over from the ancient gods and goddesses, the notion of asylum was actually adopted also by the new religion, Christianity, which was becoming better. And so monasteries, churches, and other sanctuaries continue to be sites of asylum, as even emperors sometimes would find out. In 390 AD, the emperor Theodosius, who had to deal with a riot of the population of a city called Salonica, revolting against his garrison, actually massacred 7,000 citizens of that, of Salonica, and even those who had searched shelter in the churches of the city. The reaction by the Christian church, especially one of the most famous bishops of the time, who uh, said Ambrose of, of Milan, was excommunicating the emperor and actually refusing him the entry to the church for eight months. Like a like, very 17th century now picture of, of this event, and it's interesting you know, why in the 17th century he did that, but it's another story. Now, during the Middle Ages, we have numerous examples of that, of people asking for protection in churches and even the multiplication of places considered as safe. If you go to France, you will find all these places called sauveterre, sauveté, uh, which means that it's like you're uh, protected. Uh, now, a new institution at the same time was emerging out of the church, would, which would also claim this statute. In 1088, the first university, the University of Bologna, uh, was found out. It was uh, like found, sorry. And um, that university in uh, 1155, was, whoops, sorry, in 1155, was granted by the Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa a charter which especially guaranteed the independence of the university from civil power. Uh, among other things, this constitution, which is called the Authentica Habita or Constitutio Habita, guaranteed, for example, scholars that they were protected on university grounds, 
they couldn't be pursued for anything and for their opinions, but also that during their trip, they, they, that, could also, that was also the case during their trips of study, um, and they had the same privileges as the clergy. Now, and as a matter of fact, as time goes by, as the medieval state progressively transformed into the early modern state, and as the law tended to replace more and more religion as a means of regulating violence within society, the notion of asylum tended to disappear, because it was law which was replacing it. Except in the case of the university grounds and for the scholars' use, which for that state is a tradition. And it's more a tradition than an actual legal guarantee. Besides one country, probably, uh, Greece, where asylum is actually enshrined in law, university asylum, or I should say was enshrined, since things changed this year. Now, it's, it's, this is a long story about modern Greece since the 1830 um, and the foundation of the Greek, of the Greek uh, state. 8037 Foundation of the Greek University. Um, that's a long story so about how it came to, they, they came to identify with that ancient notion of asylum, but it existed. And it took a particular turn, stop I'm trying to go fast, took a particular turn during the Greek dictatorship of 1967 to 1974. Now, in February 1973, uh, the students of the law school of Athens are occupied. Uh, the building. Uh, they went to the building and they tried to protest against the dictatorship. Now, it was called police intervention, but the, the police, the dictatorship, what it asked was like a negotiation to let the students come out and they wouldn't be harmed if they were coming out of the, of the law school. Which happened, they came out of the law school and of course they were arrested. Uh, and immediately the reaction of the students was to refer to that old event I talked about and about Sinon and starting organizing their protests by saying that that was a major breach of the tradition of that old tradition and using that to attack the, the gun dictatorship like this. And suddenly at the same time building up movement, building up their movement, uh, and while the dictatorship was saying that they were basically troublemakers, the term they were using was teddy boys, actually, to call them, uh, because it meant that they were influenced for American ideas of rock and roll and having long hair, etc., etc. Um, but the student movement united because of what had happened and actually opened up to the society. Now, the events, what happened afterwards, they actually understood that they had to open up to the rest of society. And so in 1973, uh, like almost the same year, but November 1973, this time they occupied the Polytechnics School of Athens and built a studio, a studio, a student radio, which started broadcasting against the dictatorship. It was, there was a siege. And the military, what's interesting to see is that the military dictatorship leadership was divided between the light-handed and the heavy-handed uh, at once. Now, along the line, whether they should intervene or not, now they had the precedent of what happened in February and what was going on. Now, finally, the heavy-handed side gains the upper hand, and on November 17, 1973, that was yesterday, November 17, it's like the military forces the gates of the Polytechnic School. I just I can say this, because Interesting. Now, what is, this, these are the last, these are last, some of the last things that they like. What the, the student, the last student to speak on the radio will say. Basically, we have the sound. Turn it down. Oh, okay. Well, how do you turn it down? Yeah, because then I will turn it down afterwards. After this one. What the student saying, I'm translating this. He's going to be saying, "Our brothers, the soldiers, do not." Fire, do not fire, brothers, the soldiers, we are like you, we are like you, like us, etc., etc. And then the last thing he's going to do before the radio silence is that he's actually going to sing the national anthem, on, uh, which was interesting and it was very, actually, was a very, very good move to do that, actually, again. So. We have no arms. As last thing, actually, um, the repression that followed by the uh, hardest elements of the regime, who pushed aside the more moderates and forced them out of the government, it's actually a lesson to be learned here. 
uh, is that if you let the heavy-handed dictate your policy, one day get, they get your job when you're in dictatorship. You know? uh, the other lesson, of course, to be learned is that the dictatorship won the battle against the students but lost the war that very night. Uh, moving in the polytechnic was at the same time an attack on youth, was an attack on a symbol and an ideal, and it was also a sacrilege of an antique tradition, and it was presented like this. Uh, the 17th of November became the National Commemoration Day of Resistance Against the Dictatorship, which is the first one we've commemorated. And things it became so important that in 1982, the university asylum was even encoded in law, uh, and police forces couldn't enter university grounds ever since, only in two cases. First case, upon the principal's demand if there was a criminal life-threatening situation taking place. Second case, upon invitation of the faculty senate, in which students had equal representation with faculty and non-academic personnel in all other cases of eventual criminal offense. So there's even like a really like threatening situation when the then the person can take the decision, but if not, like all other cases, this university center has to take the decision. Now this has just changed, and this aspect of the law as well as many others have been struck down by a new law just passed this year about university governance. Uh, the interesting aspect though is that although we could say that the asylum was just one small issue out of many at stake during this law, it actually focalized all the attention and became the cornerstone of both narratives, of both the supporters and the opponents of the new law. And why is this? Uh, well, in my opinion, it is typical of a general trend which has been taking place in the last 10 years in Europe and elsewhere, and which aims, one, at normalizing universities into just one link among the others in the chain of production, as I mentioned also, Catherine, Two, this movement does not to tolerate dissent and thus automatically generates attacks on the SL. And three, the all too predictable consequences of this refusal of spaces of dis dissent has been the multiplication of violence and its diffusion in society. And from now we'll see, try to see you two different ex examples of how things have evolved. Um, with the French example, which is how things have evolved since 2006, and also the Greek example, where the Greek is something to actually avoid. Now, for the last five years, there have been a lot of student and in general university demonstrations in Europe. Many of them typically involve occupations, etc. More and more authorities have had a tendency of either trying to intervene violently to stop these occupations, or using these occupations to demonstrate that the asylum is an inept and obsolete system which only encourages violent and deviant practices. And for us, the most important was like the, the first one important was started in 2006 spring of 2006, protesting against the law which was um, basically um, uh, allowing companies to hire, peop hire people for lesser, less than the minimal wages, uh, and even if they were going through, if they were still studying, etc. And we called the anti cb movement. And so for the first time, the occupation of the Sorbonne, as you see here, since 1968. We hadn't seen that since 1968, the occupation of the Sorbonne. Now, uh, the, the government was actually you know, about the, what, how to react to this. Um, the students were auto controlling this. I will pass on the, uh, the interesting footage on this, but they, they were auto controlling, they had their own security to control things. But then on March uh, 11th, uh, the situation degenerated because the riot police was called in to intervene and put this, the occupiers out. Uh, images from that. Then, of course, they started, the students started barricading themselves to people in the, in the, uh, when they, they saw the radicals coming in, etc., etc. Now, things got worse because at the same time that the Sorbonne was occupied, another building was also occupied uh, by students, which was the Ecole des Hautes Études uh, en Sciences Sociales, where actually the professors, and there we have the group of professors actually moving in the school to coordinate with the students so that the occupation takes place peacefully and there's no destruction, no vandalism of, this, of the offices, etc. But all the movement, which all the people have just been thrown out of uh, the Sorbonne in the, on March 22, will go in and actually also push some, the more, some elements, will push out the students who were occupying the building. And then, of course, we will have now what is the best thing for, um, well, let's say, uh, also government PR, which is that the vandals have been at the scientists that have destroyed everything. But as a matter of fact, that was also the reaction of that escalation of violence that had been taking place. Now, but it was, it really hurt the student movement to see to it that this thing had happened because it, it was presented as being developed. Now this lesson was learned by the students. And all the movements since 2007, like the one against the research, like against new law about research at the university, 
uh, which also started with occupations, etc., uh, decided that they were not going to only do things like occupations, but they would go out to society. Everything that Catherine has mentioned about Latin America, they'd be doing the same thing. The diets, the sit-ins, the etc. etc. The idea that we have to go out of the university and like try to get society to do that. And I like one, and for maybe just show one then. That's just like, that's what a die is. You go to the supermarket, like a certain commercial, and like, everything, and you just die. So the symbol of the students dying. Okay. That's in Brittany, that's why you have the... Okay. Just stop it because I do not have enough time. So, lots of things like this have happened and uh, for about many of the different laws. New forms of action, so like public courses here, like at the Sorbonne, etc, uh, etc. Et now, why? Why has all these things have been happening? Um, well, and why all these multiplications of laws and why all this opposition? What we've been having in Europe is what we call the Bologna process since 1999, which means the standardization and homogenization of university practices. And there is a trend initiated to see universities and education in general as just another sector providing services to clients and judged according to principles of corporate governance. Now, to reverse a statement made by several colleagues in various letters addressed to the administration of our university, for some, universities are like banks. And so only one thing kept in safety in banks, and that's money, but definitely not ideas. Uh, but as history teaches us, it is particularly dangerous for a society not to defend spaces where asylum exists, meaning where dissenting opinions exist. It is dangerous to act with authoritarianism when facing dissent. It is dangerous to let violence be the only solution. And here the counterexample, maybe but of course the example is Greece. Because then, if this is the only solution. Violence diffuses to all of society and is pretty much uncontrollable to the point that it can destroy actual society. Can I turn off the sound? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, what has been happening in Greece since 2008, and unlike, for example, France, because of the expert. In 2008, uh, the story may sound well familiar. I will just try to get there. Um, in 2008, uh, during the demonstrations were taking place of university students, um, what happened basically was that uh, uh, the police brought in underpaid subcontractors to act as uh, policemen. But they were also given guns. And during one of the demonstrations, in one of the side streets of the, you know, the neighborhood of Athens where the Polytechnic School is, so where usually incidents erupt because of all that thing, uh, one of these subcontractors actually panicked, did it purpose, he was condemned, but we don't know the reasons, and shot a 15-year-old kid, uh, 6th of December, and the, that, who was with his friends. And that erupted into a massive amount of violence in the streets of Athens that you may see here, and things since then, and because of all the crisis that's been taking place, things have only been getting worse. Uh, now, there is a pre pretty much society has come through a point where it's, there is uh, absolutely, well, probably, like dialogue is almost impossible between the two. Uh, this is sort of the. Now, then, this is not a common thing, but it has been happening a lot. That's what I would say is the counterexample of what happens when you do not allow for a certain type of dissent to exist. Uh, those are the riots of December 2008, lasted for 10 days. Uh, Athens looked pretty much like a battleground. And here. Uh, anyway. So, I'll, I'll go back. So, anyway, why is it that? Counter example, well, because, as I said, when violence diffuses into society, it goes as a gangrene and then comes haunting you back at one point. And once the circle of blight, blight retaliating violence is in motion, well, then only what Asian Greeks used to call catharsis can stop it. Thank you.
what do you do? You give them flowers. You kiss them. You're completely transforming the meaning of this symbolic space. And they were, after the, the first crisis, they were able to continue doing this. And for the next month, and even throughout much of the 90s, they continued in this form of very free speech on the part of students. They, also, they gained one-to-one -one parody on academic senates. Um, but in, in that respect, they were freer than I think you are all here today, after this major breakthrough. We'll go here and then we'll Hi. Um, I was wondering if any of you had any advice for some of us who are in student movements on how to um, integrate our movements into wider social movements and um, whether you think this is important or will increase our effectiveness. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll start actually. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I'll start actually just by a little point on the last question, which I think uh, a challenge in the 21st century North American capitalist context is like, I would describe it as the endless, boundless nature of capitalism to absorb your resistance, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, the whole, the, the discourse of like um, oppositional consumerism or uh, like youth rebellion. Unfortunately, many of the things that we saw in the 1960s are fully within the pantheon of accepted identities that you can have under capitalism. Um, so I think it is, uh, it's a question of like continually pushing the boundaries um, of every time you get to a point where uh, people in authority say, okay, we can accept this, and you go to the next step um, and just, you know, keep moving along. Uh, struggle continues. Um, in terms of like specific advice, um, I think there are two ways that I that I would answer. One is uh, in terms of like what should students on individual campuses do uh, collectively, um, and I think in Quebec, um, as I was saying before, you have a unique opportunity uh, as opposed to places in English Canada or places in the U.S. Um, to participate in a in an established radical structure of how to organize student unions. Um, uh, and that is along the basis of, of student syndicalism and, and the concept of student uh, collectives as militant basis for organizing. Um, and when, when students can do that, then they automatically are tapped into uh, labor struggles, into housing struggles, into various uh, solidarity. I liked very much what you said, that if there had been women, there would have been demands. Or... There were. It was there were. She said it. She spoke with one of them. Well, the, 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 that detail is irrelevant. The, the broader <laughs> theory that you're getting at is that women tend to think more concretely, perhaps. And this is something I've seen over and over in studying social movements, that they tend to be more connected to the real human situation, to be less. Men are easily carried away, especially single men without defendants, carried away by the abstract. <laughs> it's true. If, if we're, we're single men, we're, we're living for ourselves, we don't have anyone we need to take care of. We can imagine things like destroying the state, destroying government. Women, on the other hand, think, well, if we do that, who's going to feed the kids? Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> so, Women are, are, are generally, no, it's not clear a gender difference, but women generally are more aware of these practical things. I mean, if you read Hedy Margolis Kovai, this is something she notes in contrast with her husband frequently. Her husband, a communist, really idealistic, working himself into the ground to fulfill his vision, and she's wondering, well, but look at the real situation, look what this is really doing to people. Um, she was able to see it, whereas he could not. This is why I'm going to arouse fire, I'm sure. Um, I prefer to frame the critique in terms of violence, being against violence per se, because that's something that, that's 
a slogan that appeals not just to the young 20-something without dependents who can risk a lot, but that's a slogan that appeals to couples with children who obviously no one really wants violence. So whether we conceive of this more broadly as capitalism, a big loaded term that is probably not going to win a mass following overnight, or whether we conceive of it in some other terms. I, I think the fundamental thing that would unite everyone is being against violence, simply. And that is something women generally are, have a little closer feel for. And, and so I, I would note that in 1989 in Czechoslovakia, women were actually fairly prominent in these movements. Not a majority, but always prominent. And I think that that sense had something to do with it. I think I see a few faces in the crowd and maybe like to interject about like that. essential natures and how people feel. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe not a man could speak that. And I'm not putting anyone on the spot. I speak as an occupier. Okay, but like, still, maybe somebody else. I don't know. I, I, I think we just like careened into a whole ter like crazy terrain of debate in that <laughs>